So an exoplanet is the essentially the fancy term for an alien world, uh, a planet very similar to anything we might see in our solar system that just happens to be moving around orbiting uh, another star, a distant uh, star. So these can range from many times larger than the biggest planet in our solar system, which is Jupiter, uh, to essentially frozen worlds even smaller than Earth. So it runs the whole variety of planets, but the main point is that it's around another star, not our sun. So there's a couple of ways you can discover these planets. Uh, and it's worth bearing in mind just how difficult this job is. These guys, you know, the planets are tiny relative to this incredibly bright stars they uh, orbit around. So when we look for them, we're looking for two main effects. One is that the, uh, the planet will actually pass uh, in front of the star and it will get a slight dimming of the starlight as it actually blocks some of that light. And that transit method has been very successful. There's, of course, the, uh, the alternative, which is a, uh, what's called the wobble method. And just as a uh, star pulls on a planet to keep it in its orbit, so too does the planet pull back on the star, causing it to wobble a little bit. And I do mean it a little bit. We're talking, if you want to try and find Earth, essentially, that's a similar pl size planet to Earth, at a similar distance from its star, this Earth 2.0. You're gonna try and find a wobble that's slower than walking speed. And that is a really tough task when this thing is, you know, 40 trillion kilometers away at the, uh, at the very closest star. So these are really tough uh, measurements to make. Well, based on our solar system, we were expecting to find you know, giant gas planets like Jupiter or Saturn, uh, very far from the star. What we've seen is, is something completely different. They're what, called hot, what we call hot Jupiters. Essentially, Jupiter is so much closer to the star than in our own system. It's, it's actually about the distance from uh, Mercury, if not closer. It's incredibly hot as a result, and it's whipping around these stars. This was not expected at all, and that's by far away the most common uh, planetary system we've so uh, we find so far. The planets we've discovered, or the majority of planets we've discovered so far, I think it's a fair, fairly safe to say you wouldn't expect to see life there. They're far too hot, or they're far too cold, far too massive. The Earth 2.0, it's a similar size to Earth, similar sort of distance from its star, so it's nice, uh, nice and warm liquid water. We've actually got several candidates already in the bag. And the next step is to try to get a sample of the atmosphere. And you do that by letting the, uh, the starlight shine through the atmosphere of this, this world, just as a, as a sunset happens on Earth. And you can see the change in the light as it passes through the atmosphere, and you can make a measurement of that atmosphere. And we know that life on Earth needs water. Uh, a lot of the complex life needs oxygen. So those are the two things we're gonna try and look for uh, to begin with, and that really sets the this sort of range of, of places that you might search. In other words, we have this what's called a Goldilocks zone. You don't want to be too close to the star, it'll be too hot. You don't want to be too far from the star, it'll be too cold. For example, the, the, all the water will fro uh, freeze into ice. So you want liquid water on the surface, you want some oxygen in the atmosphere, and then recent research shows it's actually probably not even enough to be sure that that's a habitable place. You need to uh, discover other uh, chemicals in the atmosphere. Essentially anything that can't be produced in a natural way, uh, except for life. Like that is the test now that we're gonna try and uh, find in these, these atmospheres of these impossibly distant worlds around other stars. There's two new telescopes that are coming, they're very exciting. Uh, NASA's new telescope, the, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope, that will actually get the sample of the atmosphere. That's the one that will actually detect the, um, or infer the presence of life through uh, various chemicals in the atmosphere. To do better, to actually confirm that it's life, and, and in particular intelligent life, we really only have one choice, and that's to catch its radio or, or TV signals. This is going to come with the Square Kilometre Array and Australia is hosting uh, half of this, this you know, giant telescope, truly a, a square kilometre in size, the other half is in South Africa. That can pick up the TV signals and radio signals 
of many thousands, if not tens of thousands of our nearest stars, if there's an alien intelligence that's broadcasting. If we find even the Earth 2.0 that, that seems to have the conditions for life, that's gonna galvanize a huge amount of scientific research into, into genetics, into biology. If you can see another version of life, we only have the Earth to look at right now. Everything originates essentially from the same primordial soup billions of years ago. If you see a completely separate example of life, that's huge. That will actually infer or teach us so much more about how we uh, evolved, how we got going here on Earth. So I think the biggest uh, benefits based, uh, in terms of science from the you know, astronomical searches for life will actually be homegrown biology and genetics because as I say, to see the path life has taken in a different world will be incredibly instructive. Unfortunately, that level of detail, as you might imagine, will require yet another uh, telescope. And that, in terms of astronomy, is a, will be a big benefit. There'll be numerous technological spin-offs um, as we develop ever larger telescopes in space. But I think, as I say, the main beneficiary will be understanding, essentially, ourselves all the better for seeing how life has taken a different approach.